So this is Abraham Lincoln, by the way, toward the end of the Civil War, and I'm going to circle back to that uh, later in in tonight's discussion. Um, there are two questions that I wanted us to um, address uh, tonight. How do Lincoln's three most famous speeches shed light on the the period of sectionalism and civil war, and that's for you social studies uh, teachers. And then what can we learn about Lincoln's purpose and craft as an author from examining these speeches? That's for uh, you English teachers. But I think as you're going to see, and is so often the case, English and, um, and history are interwoven and difficult to separate one from the other. So the first part of my uh, talk has to do with sectionalism and the Civil War and a couple of important dates um, in Lincoln's life, just to situate Lincoln as an American. He's born on February 12th, 1809. Uh, so, the, so the United States is, is 35 years old. It's, it's a very... Um, young nation when uh, Abraham Lincoln is born. Coincidentally, you may know he's born on the same day that Charles Darwin was born uh, in 1809. And together, those two, um, those two people did much to change the 19th century. Um, but Lincoln, who grew up in extremely modest uh, circumstances in Kentucky and then moved to Illinois at a very young age, uh, runs for and is elected to the Illinois State House of Representatives and, and expresses political ambition from a very uh, early age, and then goes on to lose a number of crucial elections before he is elected to the U.S. Congress um, in 1847 and 1849, and then most importantly is elected president in 1860, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I'm so glad to be able to to talk about Lincoln and uh, his election as a president uh, the day after our own um, core belief in democratic values and in, in the ability for everybody to um, constitute the government will serve as a foundation, especially for the Gettysburg Address. Um, but the three addresses that we're going to look at are these highlighted, or in the time period that we're going to look at, are these from 1860 to 1865? And the first inaugural ad, um, address, which we'll look at, um, was given on March 4th, uh, which was in the 19th century when um, presidents were inaugurated rather than January 20th. Um, a year and a half later, the Gettysburg Address is delivered, and then uh, Lincoln's second term begins on March 4th, 1865, and he gives the uh, second inaugural address um, a month later, the Civil War ends, and then six days after the end of the Civil War, Lincoln is assassinated at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., um, so these are, these are the important um, dates for, for our um, speech maker. Uh, very, very quickly, I think um, it's no surprise that at the heart of sectionalism in the United States was the institution of slavery um, and the problem it had caused for the young nation from its very beginning, the Constitutional Convention uh, uh, went on so long largely because uh, Northern um, representatives and Southern representatives were trying to um, determine the status of enslaved people, um, how uh, states in the South with more enslaved people, um, but fewer white voters, uh, could get representation. And the, the problem of slavery and political representation unravels and unfolds throughout the first half of the 19th century. Uh, so a couple of key points, enslaved people in the South 
before the Civil War make up one third of the population. Um, in the North, the abolitionist movement, uh, which is um, uh, springs into being uh, in the fervent um, moral hope of ridding the nation of slavery, really takes off in 1830 um, and, and becomes an increasing part of the national conversation until the start of the war. And then I always like to uh, remind people that literature can also spark um, on occasion social change and social awareness. And in 1852, the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin written by Harriet Beecher Stowe will prove to be this incredibly important galvanizing novel uh, that radicalizes many people in the North while also um, creating um, strong resistance in the South. Lincoln's position in slavery uh, with regards to slavery is I, I find somewhat difficult to describe to students um, because it's a fairly nuanced position. Um, Lincoln consistently declared his opposition to slavery, but he didn't call for its emancipation for, for a long time. He believed that it was morally wrong but he also uh, believed in the uh, sanctity of the Constitution, which sanctioned the practice of slavery. And so as a politician, he repeatedly threaded a needle in which he expressed his opposition to slavery, but did not call for its um, eradication because to do so would have been to um, strike down uh, provisions in the Constitution. So his, his take on slavery will become um, even more nuanced as the 1850s um, unfurl. And I, I can't help but tell you guys that from my the seat that I sit in in Lawrence, Kansas, I'm kind of at what was once the hotbed um, and ground zero of slavery and anti-slavery um, fighting in the United States before the Civil War. And just briefly, um, the 1850s are full of a series of events that um, will drive sectional um, disagreements into greater and greater um, intensity. The first of these is the Compromise of 1850, which, as you may know, um, among other things, included the Fug Fugitive Slave Act that said if an enslaved person escaped from the South to the North, a citizen in the North was legally bound to return that enslaved person to the South. And this was um, an especially upsetting um, development for abolitionists who wanted to help enslave people to freedom in Canada, if at all possible. Um, but the compromise was originally uh, a series of bills that were aimed at trying to, to preserve the fragile balance uh, between North and South. In 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act um, is struck, and this repealed the Missouri Compromise and said that the new territories of Kansas and Nebraska would be allowed to exercise what was called popular sovereignty uh, to decide whether slavery should be permitted in their um, in their respective territories. Popular sovereignty was the idea that rather than have the federal government decide whether, say, Kansas would be a slave state or not, the people would vote. And because of that decision to allow popular sovereignty here in Kansas, um, especially there was a series of violent civil confrontations between uh, Kansans who had immigrated from the Northeast uh, 
and Western Missourians who were um, pro-slavery. I live in an old neighborhood in Lawrence, Kansas, and two blocks from where I live is a is a little marker that tells about some of the people who lived in this neighborhood who were killed in 1856 when there was a raid on Lawrence, Kansas, and all 135 men and boys were lined up and killed by uh, pro-slavery Missourians. And um, much of the downtown was burned to the ground. So Bleeding Kansas, it was a kind of trial run for the larger civil war that was about ready to erupt. And reacting to all of um, this, this uh, sectional tension and division um, was the formation of the Republican Party. Uh, it was a patched together party uh, that came from a number of, of smaller political groups, but was um, formed largely to, to um, try to curb the expansion of slavery in the United States. And once the Republican Party was formed, Abraham Lincoln uh, signed up and became a, um, a, a leading leader in, in that party. The final uh, act that um, many people believe sparked the Civil War in many ways was the John Brown John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry in October 16th through 18th 1859, and Brown uh, believed that he had been called by God to end slavery, and therefore took over the Federal Armory in Harper's Ferry with the idea that he would release its weapons to the enslaved population in the South and hopefully create an uprising that would end slavery in the United States. The, the reaction, especially in the South, as you can imagine, was so um, uh, strong that um, the divisions between those in the North who praised John Brown's raid and the uh, slaveholding states of the South were enormously, uh, the, the tension just escalated to a point of almost um, unbearable division. And it is at this moment that Lincoln is elected. So the campaign for the 1860 presidency runs through uh, the year 1860 following John Brown's uh, capture at Harper's Ferry and his eventual execution. He won the electoral, the electoral college. Uh, I can't read actually all of my notes here, but I could tell you that he, he won with the shakiest of uh, coalitions. Uh, he won the electoral college, but only 40% of the popular vote. He didn't win a single Southern uh, state, which was the first time in American um, presidential uh, election history that that had happened. He won everything north of the Mason-Dixon line, everything north of the Ohio River. He also won California and Oregon, but he was uh, in a political, a politically fairly uh, weak position as the president in that the entire South was opposed to his, um, his uh, nomination and eventual election as president. And soon after he is elected on November 6th, the succession of Southern states begins first with South Carolina, uh, one month after uh, Lincoln wins the election, and then a sort of cascading flow, Mississippi, Florida, and oh, look, Texas, right? Uh, February 1st, 1861, um, Texas is the last uh, state to declare its succession before uh, Lincoln gives his first inaugural address, which uh, occurred in March. Uh, after he gives that address, Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee um, swiftly follow. And um, Soon after the Civil War comes, in April April 12th, uh, 1861, South Carolina fires um, an artillery shell, shell at um, 
Fort Sumter formally prompting the beginning of the Civil War. And uh, there are a few things to say about the American Civil War, but first and foremost was that it was the deadliest, the bloodiest in all of American history. Estimates range, uh, the, the, the standard estimate used to be 625,000 uh, people killed uh, during the Civil War. More recently, um, and more forensically, 750,000 uh, have, have uh, been uh, suggested to have been killed in the Civil War. Of those 750,000 dead, 210,000 of those soldiers were killed in action. The rest were largely killed um, from, from diseases that ran rampant through the camps. Um, I like to tell my students to put this in perspective that during the period of the American Civil War, there were 30 million Americans uh, in the country. We now have 300 million plus um, Americans. So there were one tenth the number of, of um, people in 1861. And proportionately, that would mean that between six and seven million people would be killed if the Civil War were to be held today and the same proportions of um, soldiers killed to, to uh, the general population uh, was factored in. And you can imagine within that, that context, it would be impossible whether you lived in the north, the south, or the east or the west, that you wouldn't know someone either in your family or certainly in the friends of your family uh, who was not significantly affected by the violence of the of the Civil War. In Jan on January 1st, 1863, so the war has been going for nearly two years, um, not quite two years, um, the Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation, which uh, frees all enslaved people in the South. He does this from uh, moral conviction, but he also does it as a strategy, uh, as, a, as a sort of ruthless war strategy to um, let the enslaved people in the South upon whose labor the Southern economy relies, to let them know uh, that, that um, they can free themselves um, if they want to and join the fight in the North. And it's, it's a, an effort to undermine uh, the Southern war effort to some extent. And finally then, uh, in the middle of July um, or the middle of 1863, we have the Battle of Gettysburg, which is the, the bloodiest battle in the Civil War. And so the, this is the context that I, I want to lay out for you, um, that Lincoln is um, situated in when he is called upon to deliver these uh, three important addresses. The first one, the first inaugural address, he has just assumed the presidency and already six Southern states have declared themselves um, seceded from the union. So the minute he, he takes office, he is confronted with this problem of the nation fracturing into um, pieces. Uh, the immense, the uh, Gettysburg Address then takes, um, is given at a really high point of, um, of fighting in the Civil War. And in that uh, address, Lincoln essentially tries to change the conversation about what America can and should mean, both in the moment and in the future. And then finally, with the second inaugural address, uh, Lincoln uh, addresses a nation that is weary from war and is uh, on the um, edge of ending the war, but there's enormous uncertainty about what will happen uh, when the war is finished. And so these are like the rhetorical 
tasks that he has um, before him when he um, is uh, gives these three addresses. I I have this. This is kind of a famous side by side um, photo comparison of Lincoln, and um, the image on the left is Lincoln in 1861. This is Lincoln just as he um, has assumed the presidency. The image on the right is Abraham Lincoln four years later. And you can see the profound um, careworn expression on Lincoln's face. Um, he, he looks as though he's aged 20 years at least, it seems to me, that the, the, the toll of, um, of the Civil War weighs he and immensely heavy on his shoulders, and, and you can see the toll that it took on him uh, physically in these pictures. So, again, to reiterate, there are three rhetorical occasions, three crucial historical moments that Lincoln is going to be called to address the nation and to try to make sense of the war or to try to bring the nation together or to try to um, convince the nation that he is not this radical change agent that's going to hasten the um, division and the falling apart of of the nation. Um, he didn't tweet. He didn't um, have Facebook. He didn't, um, you know, he, he didn't have access to social media, but he did have the 19th century equivalent of social media, which was a very, very robust newspaper um, uh, industry. And I mentioned that because Lincoln was really, really adept at crafting speeches that both could soar poetically um, and with the almost the kind of um, the, the kind of stentorian um, authority of a Shakespearean play on the one hand, and then he could really bring it down so that everybody uh, could understand what he had to say. And we'll, we'll see a, a change and a development in his speeches from the beginning of the war uh, to the end where he becomes ever more adept at having his message uh, delivered clearly through the uh, printed press. Uh, I think of Lincoln as being such a um, compelling and accomplished writer because of two strains of his personality. One, for 30 some years, he was a country lawyer who was used to making concrete, um, rational arguments in defense of his clients. And so was able to construct um, these sort of beautifully cogent and almost hermetic arguments that you it was difficult for you to disagree with. Um, and this is a special trait that good lawyers have. They, 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 they erect a kind of um, argument that is difficult for a jury to quibble with. Um, he was very good at that. Um, but the other side of him is as the author, and sometimes I even want to suggest that he's, he's a poet. Lincoln read deeply in Shakespeare. He loved Shakespeare. He memorized a number of Shakespeare's plays. Um, he read deeply in the Bible. His culture was infused in the King James Bible. And his language, when he wants it to, can very much um, take on the, the poetic power of both the King James Bible and um, a Shakespearean tragedy. And so his special talent, it seems to me, as a writer of his addresses and as an orator was to combine the, the kind of um, rigid argumentation of a lawyer with the, the poetic um, flights of, of um, a very talented literary author. 
first inaugural address, as I mentioned, was uh, given um, five, almost five months after Lincoln's election. Uh, on March 4th, 1861, he stands before um, a huge crowd on the steps of the Capitol. The picture to the left is actually of Lincoln uh, delivering his um, first inaugural address. It is actually, it's, it's virtually impossible to pick Lincoln out of that crowd, but you can see that um, you could see the uh, the occasion there. The he is surrounded by uh, people down below at the Capitol. Lincoln did not have microphones. Um, he delivers this speech uh, purely with his voice. He was said to have a a Kentucky accent and a sort of high tenor um, voice that was not pleasant to the ear but carried a long way. So it, it did the job that um, he wanted it to do. And to to repeat and to remind you of the um, context that he's in, uh, he's he is facing a nation that is dividing almost by the day, almost every week after uh, his election, uh, one state or the other in the South is beginning to uh, separate and declare um, uh, themselves a part of the separate government, the, Co the Confederacy of the South. That That is um, declared in February of 1861, uh, a month before he gives this address. Uh, the Confederacy is uh, called into being. Um, and the South will soon seize federal forts uh, in their territory. And so on March 4th, 1861, addressing this huge sea of people, Lincoln is faced with the daunting task of addressing a, na a, a nation that may no longer be the United States of America because it's certainly no longer united and it is now uh, two different nations. He, as I read the first inaugural address, he has several things that he wants to accomplish. The first thing is he wants to try to convince the nation not to divide any further. He, he wants to convince any Southern states that are wavering um, about whether they should join the Confederacy or not. And there certainly are plenty of those, the Virginia and the other ones I listed uh, on the earlier slide. Uh, he wants to convince them to stay with the Union. He's hoping to marginalize the Confederacy as a, um, as a not very viable um, alternative. He wants to present himself as an agent of stability and not change, he wants to convince all of his listeners that he is not going to eliminate slavery, uh, that that is not a part of his agenda. And then he wants to, at the same time, as he tries not to alienate any Americans, he wants to gently assert that secession is illegal that nothing in the Constitution provides for states leaving the Union uh, if they're dissatisfied with who is elected president. So this is far and away the most difficult uh, speech to teach. Um, and I'm thinking of especially of those of you who have um, eighth graders uh, to teach history. Um, I would not in any way whatsoever try to teach the entire um, first inaugural. And what I've done is I've exerted a couple of key passages. Um, and I wouldn't even necessarily think it uh, important to teach all of those key passages, but they, they give a um, sense of what Lincoln is trying to do. I have taught to my first year students Lincoln's inaugural address, and I've actually set up for them the condition of the United States at this moment and asked them to craft a speech that would uh, prevent the Union from separating. And what you find if you have your students do some um, exercise like that is that they will go out of their way to try not to offend the South. 
Um, the, the goal is not to offend the South and create a, a, an even larger division than already exists. So in the first um, passage that I have here, um, and I'm going to read this first passage just to give you a sense of Lincoln's language in the, in the first inaugural, which is much more legalistic and much less poetic than the other two addresses that we'll look at. Apprehension seems to exist among the people of the Southern states that by the accession of a Republican administration, their property and their peace and personal security are to be endangered. To my ears, this sounds very abstract. And it sounds as though Lincoln is tiptoeing um, as carefully as he can as a speaker. Um, and he goes on to declare, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I have no lawful right to do so. And he's, he's saying the Constitution will not allow me to abolish um, slavery, and I have no inclination to do so. I don't want to do that. I'm I'm the president of everybody. Um, I do not want to uh, wade into a radical change that will divide this nation even farther. He then goes on to make another legal argument in the second extract that I have here, which basically he says, you know what, the United States of America is kind of like a contract, like we've all signed on that we're a part of it, and just one party can't break that contract. Um, it, it cannot be... It, all people have to agree that um, a separation or a breaking of the contract is, is necessary for it to be legally rescinded. So this is, again, Lincoln, the legal um, mind trying to make a legal argument like, hey, you can't break the contract. We all signed on the dotted line. Um, you're a part of America, whether, you're, whether you uh, still think you are or not. Um, he wants to say, he wants to say to um, all of the constituents, you know what? The situation here in the United States is imperfect. We have been arguing over slavery since the beginning of the Union. He says one section of our country believes slavery is right and ought to be extended, while the other believes it is wrong and ought not to be extended. And this is our only substantial dispute. Um, there's really, there's really not a cure for this, he wants to say. Uh, he, he talks about uh, the people imperfectly supporting the law itself. He talks about, I don't think it can be perfectly cured. We need to accept um, the fact that um, our union is imperfect and, and that we're going to have to compromise as a people. And then he... Um, throws a little shade on the South by saying, you know what, um, the language so far has been our country and one section of, I mean, our, our nation together, but then the language suddenly switches to the second person. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. And I've highlighted the way he persistently turns the attention at this point in his speech of saying, if there is a war, it's on you. You can have no conflict without uh, being yourselves the aggressors. I'm not going to uh, fire the first shot as the president of the United States. Um, and he, my duty, he says, is the most solemn one of to preserve and protect and defend the nation. And then um, finally, there is the famous um, concluding paragraph of the first inaugural uh, in which he turns the language again from you to we. And he says, we must not be enemies. Um, he talks about our bonds of affections and the mystic cords of memory stretching, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I wanted to show you, though, with this famous final paragraph, 
that Lincoln actually didn't write the original draft of the last paragraph. He wrote most of the first inaugural on his own, but his Secretary of State, uh, William Seward, former uh, Senator of New York, actually wrote the concluding paragraph of the first inaugural. And it is worth um, showing your students and looking at the way Lincoln um, revised that final important paragraph to make it more muscular, more, um, more poetic, more to the point. You can see with uh, Seward, we are not, we must not be aliens or enemies, but fellow countrymen and brethren, although passion has strained our bonds of affection too hardly, they must not, I'm sure they will not be broken. And Lincoln really boils that down to simple declarative sentences. We must not be enemies, though passion may have strained um, our bond. The, though I can't read this, I'm sorry, because I'm seeing some of your faces on, uh, on Lincoln's uh, Port, the, the portion that I've typed up of Lincoln, but you get the sense um, from this comparison that Lincoln has stripped down the kind of boilerplate political language that Seward provided him and has touched it with poetry so that by the end of, of his first um, inaugural, we are told that we should try to um, heed the better angels of our nature. The first inaugural address was not um, wholly successful because it did not uh, end the secession of the South. And of course the Civil War did come. And as I mentioned earlier, by 1863, fighting is at its peak. The Emancipation Proclamation has been um, has been signed, and over Fourth of July, eighteen sixty three, the Gettys the Battle of Gettysburg takes place, and it is the largest um, battle the the battle that involved the single largest number of casualties in any U.S. battle, um, but it is widely considered the turning point point of the Civil War. It up for the first 18 months or so, uh, whether the Confederacy or the Union would win the Civil War was sort of an open question. It wasn't at all clear. One battle uh, victory on the North would be um, matched and met by one or two battle victories by the South. And the war was largely at a bloody stalemate in the middle of 1863 when the Battle of Gettysburg took place. Um, but it, it did take place uh, with 51,000 estimated casualties. Um, and between July and November of that year, the people of Gettysburg designed a, a uh, cemetery to house um, the remains of the Union soldiers. And in November, Lincoln was asked if he would uh, give an address to commemorate that cemetery. And he, of course, does with the famous Gettysburg Address, which is a remarkable 272 words long. So much is contained in those 272 words. Um, I've I've included excuse me I've included in your in the slides uh, in the PowerPoint the entire address <clears throat> delivered on November nineteenth eighteen sixty three. Once upon a time, uh, my parents had to memorize this as part of uh, their school curriculum. I didn't have to do that, and I don't think students are doing this anymore, but um, it was once considered almost a kind of national. Uh, prayer or oration that was um, worth uh, students memorizing um, as as a kind of high point of American political life. Um, the address, and I, I'm taking this idea from Gary Wills, who uh, whose book I've included at the end of this PowerPoint. Um, uh, but uh, Gary Wills describes the Gettysburg Address as a revolution in thought. And what he means by that 
is that it is in this address that Lincoln reorients the goals and the purpose of the young nation toward the Declaration of Independence rather than the Constitution. Um, I've got the, the famous uh, second part of the second paragraph, the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal uh, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Lincoln uh, extracts some of that language in his opening four score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And, and Wills uh, wants to suggest that this is a crucial moment in American history where the values enshrined in Jefferson's declaration uh, overshadow or become the basis for the uh, direction of, of the nation rather than the much more patched together uh, work that was the US Constitution. But Wills also wants to talk about Gettysburg Address as being a revolution in style. And I hope that you heard uh, the difference in uh, rhetoric from the first inaugural address and the Gettysburg Address. I'll just uh, if I can do this. Apprehension seems to exist among the people of the Southern states that by the accession of a Republican uh, administration, their property and their peace and personal security are to be endangered versus four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. The language is stripped down. It's not that all Latinate words are eliminated, but it is that many more Latinate words are eliminated in the Gettysburg Address than, than certainly than appeared in the first inaugural. There's something else that, that Lincoln is doing here. Um, he is linking together images and concepts through a very um, efficient and economical um, repetition. And what I've done is um, shown, tr tried to signal some of those with underlining, um, with um, italicizing, with capitalizing, so that for you could see that a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition then is repeated to be so conceived and so dedicated. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field um, rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task or the discussion of now we are engaged in a great civil war. Uh, and I've got that capitalized. It too, that the idea of the war um, as, as the backdrop against which to consecrate the lives of those who fought at the Battle of Gettysburg is um, repeated war, with war, with the honored dead, with these dead. Um, and Gary Wills very astutely tells us that um, this speech is surprisingly bare of ornament, that there is very few um, unnecessary adjectives. Um, the, the Gettysburg Address is often compared to the, uh, the um, larger speech that was given on the occasion of the commemoration of the cemetery uh, by Edward Everett, which lasted two and a half hours uh, and which he had memorized, and which was this extremely um, ornate stem winder of a speech in the old style of 19th century American oration. And uh, it is juxtaposed with the 272 words that Lincoln delivers at Gettysburg, um, stripped of ornament, but strenuous and muscular. Um, and Wills makes the point um, 
that whenever possible, what Lincoln does is of, he avoids using the antecedents like it or they and uses the concrete words like battle or those, those who died, the dead. Um, he doesn't use backward referential words like former or latter, which Edward Everett uses throughout his speech at Gettysburg. And in so doing, what Lincoln does is interlock his sentences is make them um, almost like as, as dense as a poem, but in this case, a poem that joins together um, the Civil War, the idea of a nation being reborn in the image of the, of the Declaration of Independence and of uh, that rebirth occurring on a battlefield where so many young lives had been given um, up to the idea of union. And the the address the Gettysburg address is a is a is a wonderful, very short work that um, I find always um, fun and easy to teach because my students can circle um, and underline as as I've done here um, and and kind of see how not only the ideas flow, but then how Lincoln um, links together uh, these, these kind of rhetorical elements um, so that it's an interwoven or, or, or braided and beautifully constructed uh, piece of, of oration. We can go back to that um, in questions if you want. Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm going rather quickly through what is um, one of the hallmarks of of American political speech. Um, and and um, finally, we'll get to the second inaugural, uh, which was delivered exactly four years to the day after the first inaugural, but after an entire lifetime, it would seem to many Americans of bloody fighting. The war was not over when Lincoln won uh, his second term, but by the time he gave the second inaugural address, it would be over in a month. It was clear that the nation, uh, that the Civil War would be coming to a conclusion and that the Union would win. What was not clear was uh, what kind of animosity, what kind of hard feelings and division would remain in the wake of this of this ghastly uh, war, and to that point, I have I include a, co a quote by Louis Menand um, at the preface of his book, The Metaphysical Club, where he just points out that one of the remarkable facts of the Civil War is that the United States uh, did not undergo a radical transformation of its government. Uh, there was no coup d'etat. There was no um, there was no profound upheaval in the political uh, uh, democratic system that that usually occurs uh, in a, a civil war. So that in fact uh, the war becomes for Manand and I would say as well for Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address it becomes about whether this form of government is worth preserving. And if so, uh, what will be the cost of that? The rhetorical occasion for Lincoln, though, with the second inaugural address is how to begin the, the difficult task of healing and reconciliation and simple communication between sides uh, after so much violence. And he begins uh, by uh, referring to his talk four years earlier, and then um, he attempts, and I won't read through all of this because it's included in your slides, uh, but he attempts to direct the focus away from himself as president and rather to aim it towards the reunified uh, nation. He's very careful to avoid blame if he said in the first inaugural 
uh, if a war starts, it's because you, the South, started. Here, he kind of clouds the South and just describes insurgent agents who provoked um, the, or who created the war, um, and says that, in fact, both parties really deprecated the war. The North and the South, neither of them wanted it. Um, and the war came, this great passive line, as though the war was like um, the cold front that just blew in the Kansas, right? It's like the, an act of weather or uh, um, an act beyond uh, human agency. And so he's trying to, he's trying to take um, the, the human element out of, of the war and then refocus the human element on how uh, the nation will come together with the end of the war. He um, does make several uh, crucial changes, just as he did with the Gettysburg Address. Here in the second inaugural, he says explicitly that slavery was the was the cause of the war. Um, and in doing so, that he makes a a pretty stark um, shift from what he had said in the um, in the uh, first address, in the first inaugural, where he he was uh, uh, kind of careful to keep his um, his powder dry and to say, "I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, emancipate the slaves." Then, after that um, opening paragraph, we move into what is really the heart of of the second inaugural. And that is a kind of um, religious interpretation of the suffering that has occurred in the United States. He says that both, and he's, he, the word both comes up over and over again. He's trying to bring in the North and the South. Both read the same Bible and pr read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes um, his name against the other. Lincoln in the second inaugural quotes from the Bible at least four times that I count. He mentions God 14 times. He summons prayer repeatedly. And so his, um, his move as a speaker is to shift from a political interpretation of the war to a theological one. But it still is political. What he wants to say is that because slavery is a sin, the nation had to be punished. It had to be punished by, uh, by God. Um, and famously, he says that um, if God will um, decide that every drop of blood drawn with the lash in slavery shall be paid with another drawn with the sword in civil war, um, we still have to, we have to respect God's judgment. Lincoln here is no longer a lawyer arguing from premises, but he's a kind of prophet who is, who is using a biblical, um, rhetoric, um, to, to secure, among other things, a political point. He wants Congress to craft a constitutional amendment that will outlaw the sin of slavery. Um, but he also wants to cast, uh, the Civil War as a kind of cosmic battle uh, between this force that neither side was fully responsible for, but had to be enacted um, th through God's will. And finally, in uh, a return to very inclusive language that uses phrases of healing and reconciliation, um, he says, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this, is, this is like the uh, conclusion of the first inaugural address, a moment where Lincoln, uh, his, his language takes flight in a, in a extremely poetic and beautiful um, series of images about suffering and the need now to achieve and cherish, cherish a just and uh, lasting peace. And I've broken this into a poem because it is, it works as a poem. Um, 
you could have your students uh, diagram this with stressed and unstressed syllables. And I think you would discover that um, Lincoln here is writing in a, a, an incredibly propulsive, um, pulsing, um, concluding sentence that uh, uses a series of, of periodic phrases to say, let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him um, who shall have something and for his widow and his orphans and to do all which uh, may achieve a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. It's, it's not just political rhetoric. It is political rhetoric that um, achieves uh, a kind of um, heartfelt fluency that is rare, I think, in most political speeches. And uh, it, is, it is Lincoln's effort to uh, reunify a nation um, at the conclusion of a war when he's not certain whether it's possible to reunify the nation, just as he had not been um, certain whether he would be able to stop uh, Southern states from seceding. So with that, I think we have some time uh, for some questions, as you can see, um, the legacy of Lincoln's speech um, was to guide the nation through the Civil War, to combine poetic sentences um, and everyday language so that he could communicate to the entire uh, democratic uh, population, to reinterpret the American project through the lens of the Declaration of Independence, and finally to seek to, to reunify the nation. Um, all of those are enormous tasks to try to accomplish through speeches, through words. But that was uh, the situation that Lincoln found himself in as the president during the Civil War. Um, I have some resources here, which are simply places you can go to get this, the addresses, as well as Gary Will's excellent Lincoln at Gettysburg. If you have if, if you would be interested in sources for other, um, other aspects of this talk, I'm happy to provide those. By all means, email me if you have questions too, because I'm easily reachable uh, through the University of Kansas uh, English Department website. So I'll stop there and see if, if there are any questions that I can answer.